Morning, everybody. And everybody happy to be at Convo this morning? I can tell by your faces. And uh, like, who is this guy? Listen, can I just real quick tell you something about your founder, uh, Doc Falwell, who's in heaven right now? Um, the first time I got to meet him, uh, he, we invited, uh, we were having a big event in Michigan with uh, 70,000 teenagers were coming to a, a, a big stadium there. And we invited every famous TV preacher in the, wor- in, in the world or in America that we knew, and even those that we didn't know, anybody that was on TV, we sent them a special invitation. Please come, greet the teenagers there for three minutes and come at your own expense because we don't have money to pay you for your flight or anything. And of all the probably 50 different television ministries we invited, Dr. Jerry Falwell was the only one that came. He came and he greeted, and he only, at his own expense, for three minutes, encouraged his young people uh, to stay strong for the Lord. And at the very end, he said, and by the way, you need to come to Liberty University because that's where you're going to get your education. And, uh, and, and then he walked off the stage and he threw me the microphone. And I said, Dr. Farwell, thank you for that subliminal message. <laughs> and that was in 1999. You were just a child and he was thinking about you before you were ever this age to help build this place to get it ready for you to be here when you got college age. So I can say some things about him that maybe, and brag about him in maybe ways that other people can't because, um, you know, it's hard to brag about your own family. So it is a pleasure to be here. And um, how many of you just got out of high school like last year? Let me see your hand. Yeah. How many are glad to be done with that? Yeah. All the drama and all that kind of thing. Now, um, if, if I could, uh, anybody here from California? That's where I grew up. See, I live in Texas now, but uh, I grew up in California and, and Texas. You know, uh, they think California people are like, whoa, you're from a different planet. You're not from a different, you know, state. And in Texas, if you want them to like you, you have to say, listen, I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could. And uh, they're like, oh, okay, you're, you're nice then. You're, 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 it's not your fault. And, um, but, I, but I grew up in California going to dead, dry, boring, regurgitated, petrified kind of churches. I mean, the kind of church... I don't know if you've ever been in a church like this before. I felt like I was doing time every Sunday morning. I felt like I was in jail, man. What did I do to deserve this? How long can I get out on good behavior or what? And um, in fact, one church I went to was so dead. How dead was it? Listen, I'm sorry. It's really not a joke. This is true. It was so dead that the ushers had poles in their hands. And these ushers would walk around and patrol the aisles during the sermon. And the pole they had, they somehow they put a tennis ball at the end of the pole, and they would patrol, and they were watching for anybody falling asleep. And if you started to nod off, they would reach out to the middle of that pew, and they'd push your head up back up with that little tennis ball. Now, you, I'm not, I'm I'm not exaggerating, this is true. You know you're going to a dead church if you've got ushers with poles in their hands to keep you awake. And uh, so I went to all kinds of churches like that until when I was 16, I was a party animal, Anybody used to be a party animal here? Come on, you can be honest. Used to be, used to be. And um, I was a party animal and a friend invited me to church. How many of you guys invited, ever invited somebody to church? You need to keep doing that, right? So a friend invites me. I was the guy that like would never say yes. I'm the guy like, yeah, right. Luce is going to say yes. Sure, right. You know, but he invites me and I'm like, sure, I'll go. God's cool. I'm cool. We'll get along. And so, um, so I'm arrogant as well. So I go to church and these people love God. It freaked me out. People in church that love God. I, I'd never been in a church like that. I mean, they were like singing with their mouths. All I ever heard was like the organ and stuff. And, 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 then, and then the preacher got up and it was the first sermon I ever heard in English. How many know what I'm talking about? You ever heard a sermon that has so many long Christianese words in? You got to have a dictionary just to figure out what's going on. And... Um, the dude's like talking normal words. And I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm just a heathen party animal, 16 years old going, why didn't anybody ever tell me this before? I felt like I got robbed going to church. And like, and so uh, he goes to give a chance for people to give their life to Jesus. Man, bam, I'm in. If somebody would have told me this a long time ago, I would have been in. And I just get on fire for God. I'm a freak. I mean, I felt like I found the cure to cancer or something. I mean, I was so happy about this thing. I'm like, Jesus is inside me and all this. And, um, and so I, w- I was trying to tell all my friends about this. I don't know if you've ever done that before. Um, tried to tell friends about Jesus and you didn't know what you were talking about. It happened to me a lot. In fact, I was so excited that um, about three weeks after I got turned on to the Lord, I'm just trying to help you understand my background before we get to the message here because I think you'll understand why and who I am. But um, three weeks after I got turned on to the Lord, I came back to my 
my house where I lived, lived with my dad. My parents were divorced. I'd run away when I was 15 to go live with my dad. Now I'm living with my dad and my stepmom. I come back three weeks after I'm turned on to the Lord and all my stuff's on the front porch and the door's locked. I'm like, what's going on? I'm knocking on the door. I'm knocking on the door. Finally, my younger brother, who's bigger than me, comes to the door and says, um, hey, I can't let you in. I said, what do you mean? I live here. What's my stuff doing on the front porch? He says, dad says, I can't let you in. I said, but, but I live here. What are you talking about? He says, well, mom, referring to my stepmom, says you're too much of a Jesus freak. And she said, either she's going to leave or you have to leave. So dad chose you. So I'm, I'm like 16, where am I going to go? Because I don't know, I just can't let you in. So I don't know what to do. I, I pick up my stuff. Now when you're 16, what do you have? I had like weights and a clock. So I went and put it in my car. <laughs> and I'm, I'm driving away in my piece of junk car, you know, and I'm driving and I'm crying, man. I'm like, God, they never got mad at me for partying. Now I'm trying to do the right thing and I don't have a place to live. What am I going to do? And uh, so I... Um, I ended up finding a couple of college friends that I just met at church. They let me sleep on their couch for a couple of weeks until my pastor, uh, the guy that speaks English, you know, um, uh, found out that I got kicked out. And so he invited me to his house for my 17th birthday, the summer before my senior year. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm sitting down with the pastor uh, having a, and his family. It was weird. Like there was a mom and a dad and kids. It was weird. Like all around the table, loving each other, like a real family. Freaked me out. And... Um, and so like they're, they're, uh, they're, you know, gave me a little present. I was on my best behavior because I'm, I'm just a heathen, man. I just got saved. And like, I'd watch my mouth. I couldn't use any of the sign language that I knew. Uh, and, uh, and I thought I did pretty good until the next day I got a phone call at my, I was working construction in the summertime and I got a phone call at my work. It said, the pastor wants to see you in his office after work today. I'm like, oh no, what did I do? Now, I'd been to the principal's office many times. How many of you guys been to the principal's office growing up? You know? I was no longer afraid of the principal's office. I knew my way around that place. I could get away with anything. But the pastor's office where he meets with God? What did God tell him about me? It's like, I'm going and I'm shaking. I think this is like the holy of holies, right? And I'm going to the pastor's office and I'm shaking. And that was where this pastor invited me to come live with him and his family for my senior year of high school. And this is a man of great faith because he had three beautiful teenage daughters. And he's inviting me to come live with him, right? And um, these people are just like family to me today. And, and I, don't you thank God for an older generation who takes a risk on behalf of a younger generation? That's what he did. That's what Dr. Falwell does. That's what all the faculty and staff do here today. They love you. So I'm excited about Jesus. I'm, I'm a freak, right? And I'm trying to tell my friends about Jesus. Now, I, you know what to say. I just know he changed my life. And I'm saying stuff like, yeah, it's like the blood of Jesus. It's like so awesome. You're like, it's just like, it, it's like you don't have to kill lambs anymore because Jesus is like the big lamb and then blood gets on you and then you're forgiven. And people are like, what are you talking about, dude? I'm like, yeah, it's great. Like the blood of Jesus. Like it's awesome. It's the blood and, and no more lambs. He's like the big lamb. What happened to you, dude? You know, and um, trying to figure that out and, 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 and they didn't know what happened to me. I'm still trying to figure out what happened to me, except I know it's real. Jesus changed my life. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> changed my life. So anyways, one of the things that we do now, with these, all these Acquire the Fire events, as Johnny was saying, we do mission trips for young people. And one of the things we help them do is help them to explain this thing that happened on the inside. And it's so much fun to do it in another country. How many have ever been on, an, on a mission trip to another country? Let me see your hand. How many have never been on a, on a mission trip to another country? Let me see your hand, okay? I just want to encourage all of you to go. Go sometime, go for a week, go for a month. Liberty has lots of trips. Go somewhere, go. Because the great thing is when you go to another country and you're talking about Jesus and they make fun of you, you don't understand. <laughs> you're like, hey man, they love me. You know, you preach more. And, uh, but uh, the, the cool thing though is, and I've seen it happen hundreds if not thousands of times when young people in your generation, college age, are sharing their faith and you're just trying to describe the miracle that Jesus did inside you. And then you pray with that guy who's the chief of the village or whoever, and they really encounter Christ. And you can see the light come on and the sin shackles fall off. And there you are. And I've seen it happen to 13 and 14 and 15 year olds. And they're like, I can't believe it. That guy just, that guy's going to heaven. I can't believe it. God used me. I, he prayed with me. And, and they're laying in bed in their little hut and they're swinging in their, you know, uh, their hammock or whatever, and they're thinking, God, if you could do this with me when I'm 14, what could you do through me the rest of my life? That's exactly what we ought to be thinking about. Amen? What could God do through us the rest of our life? So I encourage you, go somewhere on a mission trip while you're young. In fact, this summer, we have lots of trips going. And if you would dare, 
go on a trip and help be a leader for other teenagers. Be like a big brother, big sister. And uh, if you're interested in just more information, go for a week, go for two weeks, go for a month. Please um, just take your phone out right now and you can text this, go now to this little number and then we'll just give you more information and then you can do that. Meanwhile, take your phone and also click to the Bible if you have a Bible that's uh, in your phone. But you, if, you, if you, I don't know, the number didn't come up. It's, uh, if you click go now, text go now to 82257. There it is. Um, then um, we'll just get you more information and you can go and be a leader, a team leader, a coach, an encourager. And in Daniel chapter 3 is where we're going to turn in the scripture. And um, how many of you guys like the Bible? Oh, good. I wanted to make sure I didn't have to change my whole message. Um, good. The Bible is good. And, and, and how are you feeling this morning? Feeling okay? How are you feeling? What about you guys in the back? How are you feeling? What about the very back row? How are you guys feeling? Do you feel like James Brown this morning? Come on, you can worship to a little James Brown, can't you? Put your hands together. Come on. Little worship to James Brown in the morning? Come on. How many of you guys know this song? How many of you guys have ever heard this song before? And if you listen real carefully, you will hear his theology. And, and maybe it's so, sort of like your theology. It may be a little off, you know, you want, wouldn't want to preach from it, but it's, I feel good. And if, and, and if you sing it like a Christian, then you'll sing it like, like, like a Christian should. Because we have lots of reasons to feel good, right? I mean, we've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. We talked about blood. How many are excited that you've been bought by the blood? And, and we serve a king who died but then rose again. How many feel good about that, that he's rise, risen again? And then he's coming back one day and he's going to take us with us. How many feel good about that, get to be with him forever? We got a lot of reasons to feel good, but if you're not careful, you'll also add another whisper to the end of that. I feel good like a Christian should. And the whisper sounds like this. And as long as I keep feeling good, I'll keep acting like a Christian should. And we add our own little whisper to the end of a lot of our theological references and understanding and commitment. We live in a feel-good culture where we don't do, for the most part, we don't do what's right, we do what we feel. I know I can't afford this car, but I feel so good driving it, so I'm getting it. I can't afford those pants, but I feel so good in them. We do what we feel. We don't do what's wise for the most part in our culture. We do what we feel. Even, we're even told that your feelings, your culture is told, our feelings is the real you. If you don't do what you feel, you're not being authentic. It's not really you. We have a misunderstanding of our feelings. Our feelings are meant to augment our life, enhance our life, not run our life and control our life. We, we end up, you hear this kind of thing going on in the culture. Listen, I, I know I committed to you till death do us part. By the way, my wife is here. 30 years married, almost 30 years, right over here. Katie, why don't you lift up your hand? You know, it's hard to preach when the most beautiful woman in the world is sitting here distracting you, but I'm going to try, okay? Uh, uh, 30 years, she's putting up with me, okay? You ought to give her a hand clap for that. <laughs> so watch this. You'll hear the, kind of the commentary. I know I committed to you till death do us part, but I don't have feelings for you. I have feelings for her. No, it's, I'm not bad feelings. They just left. Now I have these feelings. I have to be true to myself. You wouldn't expect me to stay in a marriage and be unhappy. All this logic that kind of flows through our culture. We do what we feel. We don't do what we committed to, what we know is wise, what is healthy or smart. And in a feel-good culture, it's easy to take on and embrace something like feel-good faith. I'll follow Christ as long as it feels good, as long as everything's easy, as long as the path is merry. I want to turn your attention to a passage in, in Daniel. You remember the three Hebrew children, Ab, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego. Remember, they, um, they, they loved the Lord God. They were taken slaves in another country, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had made a you know, a golden statue to himself, and he commanded any time the music played, everybody had to bow down and worship. Not that he had an ego problem or anything. 
So, uh, but these three guys wouldn't do it. You know the story. They're about your age, right? They're like 18, 19, 20. These are like, I love people that love God with an attitude like that, you know, like, yeah, just. And so they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. So the king brought him and said, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to play the music and you're going to bow down. And if you don't, you go in the furnace. And, and, and they just had a little bit of holy, righteous attitude. And this is what they said. Daniel chapter three, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blaze, the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of the gold that you have set up. Now, if you look real closely, just look at the verse for a second. Go ahead and put it back up on the screen. I want you to see there's, there's two kind of, if you were to think about your faith is a coin. There's two sides of this coin. The first side you'll see up there, he says, um, we're not going to bow down. Our God is able and he will. So the first side of the coin is the kind of faith that says our God's able and he will. They were absolutely confident. They knew God would deliver them. They knew they would not burn up. He is able and he is willing. And this side of faith is important for us to have confidence when we pray according to God's will that he's going to do that. He loves us. He's able. Sometimes you think, well, I know he's able to do this thing, but I'm not sure if he's willing. But when you look in his scripture and you see what he's willing to do and what he's able to do, we pray with confidence. We have great confidence in our God. And that side of faith that says, you know, I know God's good. I know God loves me. I know I, I pray for sick people and they get healed. Sometimes I pray they don't get healed right away, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to pray for the next sick person or the next person that's struggling. Like, because I know the nature of God. He's good and he is able and he's willing and we have great confidence in that. The problem is sometimes we add to that in our mind, that little whisper that we add to feel good faith. And we say, and I, he's able and he's willing and I'll keep following him as long as he does. Answer every prayer. Make everything easy. Have no challenges. It's really not hard. My life is perfect. Because somehow we've been, we've been given this message. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And like, if it's not wonderful, I'm not doing it anymore. Because I was promised wonderful. You know, I, it may be more accurate. God loves you and has a dangerous plan for your life. God loves you and has an adventurous plan for your life. Wonderful? Eh, maybe not so much. Wonderful in a different way. And we buy into this kind of conditional faith. Jesus ran into guys like this. I'll follow you, Lord, if. Only if. Only if I can say goodbye to my family first. Only if I can bury my dad first. And Jesus, it seems like he's cold. Let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus, you are so cruel. Really? D dive into that. Dig into that. Let the people that are concerned about physical things deal with physical things. He says, anybody that puts their hand to the plow and turns back, it's not even worthy of coming. He said, like, if you hear me inviting you to follow and you are double-minded, I think I will, I'm not sure, let me do this, only if, if, and we make these little backroom deals with God, God, if you do this for me, you get stopped by a cop, God, please get me out of this, I'll be a missionary, you know, like that. Help me with this grade, I know I haven't studied all semester, but God, do a miracle. You bring it back to my memory, he can only bring it back if you put it in there first, right? So, uh. He's like, but you know everything, just give it to me. And uh, we pray these rescue, God, I'll do anything for you. I'll give you my whole life if, only if, these conditional kinds of commitments to the Lord. Jesus was like, listen, if you heard me making the invitation and you, you're double thinking, don't come. If you have to double think this thing, you don't really understand who it is that made the invitation. You know, a lot of times people came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you, I'll follow you. And almost every time he said, are you sure you want to? Remember the guy that's going to fight in the war? He makes sure he has enough army guys to finish the war. Are you sure you want to do this? The guy that's going to build a building, make sure he has enough supplies to finish the building. Are you sure? He's making them double think it. In fact, one day he gave a sermon. <laughs> you know, a lot of his sermons were entertaining. Parables, they were entertaining. But this one sermon was not at all. It was like, eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no part of me. And people are like, this guy wants us to eat him? Are we supposed to be cannibals? They were really thinking that. And they started leaving. And the disciples go, what should we do? And Jesus, Jesus says to his disciples, now if I was Jesus, I would have said, no, don't leave. No, don't. He didn't do that. He said to his disciples, do you want to leave too? The only guy I ever met that gave an invitation for people to leave him. 
As the choir sings, I'll fly away. Go ahead, step out. I see that hand, leave. You know, you go ahead, leave. I see that hand. I mean, that's what he's doing. And he's like, listen, if, just because you don't understand one little message, if that's going to make you leave, then you're not really here. And Peter says these words, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. We don't really get it. We don't really like it. We don't really understand it. But you've grabbed a hold of the deepest part. And even though I don't understand, I still have to follow you. That one side of faith that says he can and he will. Let's make sure we don't add on and I'll only follow him if everything seems easy. Everything seems convenient. He never promised a life of convenience. These conditions. What if we, instead of having this idea that I'll follow you as long as everything's fine, what if we just took this as a premise? God is the rightful owner of this universe and he's the rightful owner of my life. Even before I gave it to him, he put breath in my lungs. And when I gave it back, it wasn't like I was doing him a big favor. It was like I rightfully needed to give it to him because he gave me life to begin with. He's the rightful owner of the universe and the rightful owner of my life. Because when tough times come, and sometimes they will, if you only have feel-good faith, well, too many people are saying, forget that Christian thing. Just a little over a year ago, we had a challenge like that in our own family. I got a phone call from somebody I didn't know. He says, is this Ron Luce? And I said, yes. It's a woman on the other end says, I have your daughter Hannah here in front of me, and she's fine. Now, no parent wants to get that call. Glad she's fine. What are you talking about? Who are you? My daughter. She's in a plane right now. She's on her way to one of our events. No, she's here. I said, where are you? She said, in the middle of Kansas. I said, what, what are you talking about? You know, she's here and she looks like she has burns on her body, but, but, but she's fine. My, my, my daughter and four other guys were in a small plane on their way to one of our Choir of the Fire conferences in Iowa. And uh, <laughs> one Iowa person. And uh, it turns out that uh, the, the woman says, it looks like the plane has gone down. There's smoke on the horizon. Your daughter's here. She's come to the street with somebody else who looks like he's burned a lot worse than her. My wife and I jump in the car and we're on our way to the airport. And we are praying. We're seeing some reports online that says that there's some fatalities and I refuse to believe it. I can't believe it. It can't be. It just can't be. It just can't be. Two of these four guys were brand new staff members. They all four loved God. All four uh, graduated, wanted to change the world, make a difference with their lives. I'm glad my daughter's alive, but I can't bear the thought that there's four families without sons and I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. I fly uh, from Dallas to Kansas City where they've taken my daughter. She's got third degree burns. She's got to have skin grafts on a third of her body. She's in ICU. We're not sure if she's going to make it at first. And we're praying for her and praying for the families. Over the next week, I'm gone four different days, four different funerals. Hannah wanted me to go to each of these four funerals, trying to encourage these godly Christian parents that had no way of understanding this. I'm back at Hannah's side, and for months she's recovering. After two months in the hospital, she's in our home, and she's got burns, and she's got memories of everything. Her friends burning in front of her, crawling over bodies to get out of the plane trying to figure out why, why? And there's some things that happen, you just don't understand that question, you don't know. And it really challenges your faith. What will you do when you don't understand? Will you still trust God even when things seem to fall apart? When things maybe even seem to contradict what you believe about the Bible, what you believe about your own theology? Is it a feel-good faith that I'll follow as long as I feel good, as long as it's easy? Challenged our faith. I was mad at God. I don't know if you've ever been mad at God. You're probably more spiritual than me. I was mad. God, why? This is your plan. I hate it. I'm mad. I don't like it. It's hard to be happy that your daughter's alive and mad at God at the same time that others have lost their lives. There's that side of faith that says, you know what? No conditions. He can He's able and he's willing. And in spite of whatever I'm going through, I'm going to trust him. The other side of the faith, that coin of faith, if you go back, put the Daniel scripture back up, the second side of that faith is where they said, Lord, they said to the King Nebuchadnezzar, he can and he will, but even if he doesn't, everybody say even if. No, I'll say it like you mean, even if. Imagine their heads, 
the shoulders back, their head up high, even if he doesn't. What are you talking about, man? You just said he can and he will. But they, they said, you know what? Our faith allows for the fact that we don't understand everything. We know he can and we know he will. But the other side of the coin, and it's not a paradox, it's a paradox, but it's not contradictory, put it that way. Even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, we will not bow. We will not worship your gods. Scripture says we see through a window dimly. We understand some things about God. We don't understand everything. The even if kind of faith says, you know what? Even if my prayers aren't answered, even if everything isn't lovely, even if I don't get the next promotion, I'm going to still follow God. Even if things get tough sometimes, I'm going to still follow him. I know a lot of things, but I don't know everything. And I'm afraid here in America, here in the Western world, we've lost a lot of this, mm, this, mm, this even if. It doesn't matter. Do your best. Mock me. Throw me to the lions. See, this is our heritage. This is who we came from. We followers of Christ. This is our tribe. This is our people. We're the people that say, even if Nero had people burned alive in his garden, Christians burned alive for lighting for his parties. Even if we will not recant. People around the world that have become martyrs on mission field, even if we will go to our grave, at least we're going right to heaven. That kind of faith that says, drag me through streets of broken glass, even if. I wonder where that kind of conviction is. What if we had the kind of attitude that says, you know what, God has already been so good to me. He's already answered so many prayers. Even if he doesn't answer one more prayer the rest of my life, I'm still on the winning side. I still get the better half the deal. Even if. Like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Do your best. Do what you want to be. What if we focus on the things that we do know, not the things we don't know? We do know that he died on the cross. We do know that he rose again. We do know that he's coming back again. We do know that he's a good God and we're going to be with him forever. And some of the things we don't know, well, we don't know about those. What if we focused on the things that we do know? What do you do when you, you have no answer to a prayer? What do you do when there's a leader, a Christian leader that really lets you down? Somebody that really betrays you. I thought they were such a Christian. There's so many people that walk away, all those hypocrites in church. Really? Was your faith in them? You're judging God's character based on a feeble human being that's fallible? That even if kind of faith says, you know, I know people are going to let me down. Go ahead and forgive him in advance. Even when God doesn't make sense. Even if faith says, you know, even when I don't understand, I will follow. When I don't like the circumstances, I'm going to follow. When I, when I don't get a prayer answered, I'm going to follow. When I'm not having fun, you know, feel good faith says, I got to have fun all the time. This is not about having fun. Hey, there are great fun moments. Paul and Silas had some great fun. Different kind of fun. Going to jail. Woo! Now, I'm not talking about like in here in Lynchburg. I'm just talking about like for preaching, you know, um, that are following. Feel good faith is not conditional following. Again, if we took the premise, God is the rightful owner of this universe. He's the rightful owner of my life. Feel good faith says, you know what? Jesus said, those who endure till the end will be saved. Isn't it interesting that he would use the word endure? He didn't use one word on accident. Think about things you endure. You don't have to endure ice cream. Okay, I'll eat it all if you make me. Pizza, you're going to make me eat that too. You don't have to endure things you like. Jesus was hinting here, listen, there'll be some moments in this following of me that are not pleasant. People are going to hate you. They might persecute you. Those who endure, that's the even if kind of faith. I want to just close by sharing a story with you that a man that lived in the 1800s, Horatio Spafford. Horatio was a, a lawyer, very well-off lawyer in Chicago. And he had um, been very profitable, had a bunch of kids, and now he had a baby son. And a year after his son was born, he, he, he died. He continued to serve the Lord. Um, about a year later, the great Chicago fire happened, burned down half the city, burned down his business. He started all over again, continued to serve the Lord. A few years later, they were going on a trip to England, him and his four daughters and his wife, to meet up with D.L. Moody, who was doing a big uh, evangelistic event in, in England. He was going to go be with them. They got on the boat, 
uh, I think it was probably here in Virginia Beach. They were ready to leave and his um, assistant said, hey, something's urgent. You've got to come back to Chicago, tend to the business. So he gets off the boat and tells his wife, I'll be there as quickly as I can. Not long after he's back in Chicago, he gets a note. It says, saved alone. What should I do? It turns out that the boat, the ship that she was on with the four daughters on the way to England in the middle of a fog bank hit another ship. And it, apparently it looked like everyone had perished, everyone died. Even his wife, who had passed out but then somehow got caught on some of the debris from the boat, was floated to the top and lived. She makes it to England and writes him that cable. He gets on the next ship to go comfort his wife and on the way to England, he's on the ship, the captain called him to the bridge and said, we think this is the place that the other ship went down and your daughters perished. And it was there in the middle of the ocean that Horatio began to pen these words. Words to a song that you've probably sung hundreds of times growing up. I want you to think about his state of mind as he's writing these words. After having lost so much, grieving his four daughters, his son, his business, he writes these words that are sung all around the world, churches, in hymns, And it kind of correctly depicts how we as Christians can approach this even if kind of faith. You've heard the words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. He says, sometimes I have this overwhelming peace and it's beautiful to walk with Christ. And then sometimes the sorrow is so hard it's like waves pounding on me. I want you to think about it this morning. Here you are at the front end of your life. You're 18, you're 19, you're 20, you're 21. That even if kind of faith says, I'm going to endure to the very end. Now look at this next verse that he writes. Remember, he's been crushed by tragedy. So I see what's going on here. Satan is trying to destroy me and discourage me and keep me down. I destroy my hope, my focus. But his focus was on what Christ had done. He said, I'm so humbled that he has rescued me and forgiven me and given me a new heart. That is what consumed his heart even in the midst of tragedy. Would you just close your eyes with me for just a moment this morning? Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Some that might be in the middle of a storm right now. A storm for their faith. A storm for their security and their focus on you. They might be in the middle of a really hard time right now. Father, it's the times of storm that we need to run to you, not from you. Could I just ask you to be honest this morning? With your eyes closed. If you're saying, man, I'm just in the middle of a storm, maybe it's my family, maybe it's with friends, something's going on in my life, something's trying to rattle my faith. I just want to pray for you specifically. Lift up your hand real high if that's you. Father, I just thank you that you're the peace in the middle of the storm. And with your hand lifted, if you'd say, I'm going to, instead of letting go, I'm going to reach out and grab a hold and have the even if kind of faith. Lift up your other hand. Would you say, okay, God, I'm going to reach out and grab a hold of you, not let go. Even when I don't understand, I'm going to hold on to you when it seems like a struggle, Lord, because that's what we do. That's our tribe. We are followers of Christ, the Son of God who gave us life. Can we just sing these words together now in closing? It is well. It's well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. 
Can I just ask you this morning if you say, I'm going to step up to the next level. No more even if. I'm going to have the no more only if. I'm going to have the even if kind of faith. No matter what, that's the kind of follower, lifelong follower of Christ I want to be. Would you stand up to your feet? Say, okay, I'm making my stand right now. It's the even if kind of faith. The kind that we see with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going all the way to the end. I'm going to endure to the end. I'm not going to give up halfway. I'm not going to be discouraged by what the enemy throws my way. I'm going to stand, and I'm going to stand. I'm going to hold other people's hands, and I'm going to stand no matter what it takes. Thank you, Father. I want us to sing it one more time, and we'll close. It is well with my soul. All together. It is well with my soul. It doesn't matter what's going on around me, Lord. It is well. It is well. It is well with my soul. What's the soundtrack to your faith? Is it I feel good? Or it is or is it it is well? I say it is well. What say you? With my soul. It is well. It is well. Amen, and you're dismissed. Have a great day.